Hello, everyone from Assiniboia, Saskatchewan. It's a beautiful day here. You're traveling. Glad you made it there safely, Penny. Well, I took my time, so it I sort of did it over the course of three days, so it worked out well. Hardly any traffic on the roads. I don't know where everyone is. Stuck in our houses, <laughs> under quarantine. For sure. It seems weird checking in at seven o'clock. It's like, what happened to the day? Laura here, welcome to the homeland. Say hi, Penny, for me. Hi, Laura. Hey, Tara, if you want to um, add me as a host, I can make that, that sound go away. So do we need to put our name in, in the uh, chat? Yes, please. Hey, Penny, it's Lindy. I was going to say it's six o'clock here and I'm also wondering what happened to the day. Some days are just like that, I guess. Well, last night we told you about the uh, hard rock group Metallica having a concert at the drive in concerts. They can go to drive in and some places like Carla Wosley here in Saskatchewan and watch the concert. So we wondered, would you attend? Evie says hello. See them on screen. Who? Evie. Your, dog, your favorite doggy, Evie. Oh, great. Hello. And by the way, she's still shedding. Yes. You're 17 minutes away from my family farm. I expect some uh, pictures, please. Of their farm? No, just around the Cinnaboy area would be great. Yeah, I was watching some people um, threshing their wheat today. Brought back a lot of memories. Pretty, looking pretty nice out there. I'll take a couple of pictures for you. Hopefully you guys can see me and hear me okay. We're just going to wait, get a few more people on and we'll get going. Can you guys hear me and see me okay? My computer charger crapped out, so I'm on a phone. Is it okay, Tara? I can see you. You see me okay? All right. We'll start with a joke. Who's got some jokes? My little girl told me a joke the other day. Why did a cowboy get a wiener dog? I'm already yeah. laughing. I don't even know the punchline. <laughs> Just like the something about one. get along, little doggy. A little doggy. Yeah. 
Come on, little doggy. You want a long little doggy? What do you call a cow that's just given birth? Decaffeinated. Correct. <laughs> Somebody's got kids. <laughs> All right. Next week. Oh, no. Next time we do a regional call, you guys have to come with some uh, fillers. Some... What do you call a blind dinosaur? A do you think he saw us? <laughs> Carmen, that's a good one. <sighs> okay, so Heather, since you started on, us off on next time there's a regional call, do you want to start <clears throat> off with announcements? Yeah, why don't you start off with that? You got the dates for it right in front of you? I'll pull up. I don't. All right, okay. so tonight, tonight is going to be the last planned. Uh, class for the dog dog interaction class. So we are going to give everybody uh, the next three Thursdays off. Um, generally, we would have had kind of a more spread out class schedule in the summer. And so uh, the puppy class trainers have advocated on all the razors behalf and said, would you please give us a block of time off? So there will be no Thursday classes the 20th the 27th and September 3rd. You will have your check-in class from this class this coming Tuesday, and then there will be two Tuesdays off. So we will plan on reconvening on the 8th, which is a Tuesday. You will plan on reconvening with your Tuesday classes. It will all also be in the e-blast, and Tara, I'm assuming also on the hydrant. Tara is nodding. So. Don't worry if you can't remember, but this is basically, this is the last Thursday for at least three weeks and you will have one more Tuesday class and then a two week break to just chill out, enjoy the end of summer, figure out back to school shopping if the kids are even going back, I have no idea. Um, and then the puppy raising group is meeting again this coming Tuesday and we're gonna kind of map out a plan for September at least to determine whether we continue with Thursday night classes every week, whether we go back and do uh, just Tuesday classes for the next little bit. And in the meantime, Heather and I put out, put together kind of some breakout webinar stuff um, on different topics that may be a regional class for everybody, or maybe just for smaller groups who are, are having problems that need some solutions, um, or whether we have kind of a webinar that appeals to everybody every X amount of time. So that is all a little bit up in the air right now. Uh, we're taking next week definitely on our call to talk about it and then uh, potentially over the coming couple of weeks we will discuss um, what it's going to look like for us for the next little while. Heather, do you so have if you're yeah if your regular class day is Thursday Sorry. then that's your Thursday. Um, the Okanagan uh, would it, if your regular class day was Wednesday or it was Thursday for a while um, we'll figure out that and we will host that as well. That'll be Jackie and I um, uh, with Brian on there. So, um, yep. Awesome. All right. And then uh, Susie and Tara are going to start us off with some announcements and then we are going to jump into it. Um, I am going to be moderating tonight. So if you need to tag me on anything, uh, go for it. And I will read questions out to Heather at opportune times. But anyways, Susie and Tara, take it away. All right, it's All actually right. Susie taking it away. I'm just bringing <laughs> stuff up on the screen, so. All right, can everybody hear me? Is, is this thing on? It is. Here, yeah. Excellent, excellent. All right, um, so hello everyone. Um, I'm just gonna take a quick moment to really launch our Move for Pads event. Um, we sent out a e-blast today. Um, Tara and I have been working really hard, Grant and everything ready um, for the launch and we're super excited to finally send that out. Um, we have just a few minutes to kind of go over a few things and if you do have any questions I will ask you that you can uh, email me or um, or the events uh, email which is events at pads.ca and we'll definitely try to get you answers uh, for whatever 
you have questions for. Um, so what is MOVE? Um, for those of you have, that have been around for a while, it's the walk and roll for independence reimagined. So we're taking the concept of a walkathon, a runathon, uh, you know, cops for cancer sort of like initiatives, and we're now asking that our con um, our community binds together to come and fundraise all together for pads. We're looking to have everyone included. So we didn't want to specify um, a, a movement goal. And that's why we're just using the term move. Um, we'd like for you to set your own goal and basically uh, blast it out to your networks, your friends, your family, your coworkers to support your movement goal. Uh, you can walk, you can ride, you can roll, you can swim, hike, paddle, pedal, whatever floats your boat. Um, it starts today, even though we've actually had some people start earlier. Thank you for those. Uh, but we will actually have everything wrap up um, come September 19th. So you have a good month to get your move um, initiative and your goals up and running. This is going to be completely COVID safe. So we want everybody to participate um, on the, ho you know, at home or on the trails or on the water, um, but in a very safe social distancing way. So um, if you do need help trying to figure out what your purpose or what your goal is going to be, feel free to reach out to me. I've got a number of creative ideas that I have uh, uh, already shared to many other people, um, but for sure, if you have something in mind, we can totally brainstorm something through. Um, so Tara actually had this brilliant idea to come up with the top 10 reasons to join MOVE. So we'll go through them really quickly. Uh, they're brilliant. Um, but basically, um, I don't know, Tara, do you have them as like a, as a slide? You don't have them as a slide. I'm oh, sorry. too bad. Okay. Slides, but that's okay. That's okay. So we'll go through them really quickly. Number 10, you can get started with nothing more than a phone with an internet connection. Number nine, the coolest swag fundraising incentives around, handpicked by yours truly. Uh, number eight, a cool participant bandana for your dog and a t-shirt for you, because let's face it, our dogs dig fashion. Um, <laughs> we have number seven, the opportunity to challenge other regions, friends, or coworkers and own bragging rights for a whole year. This is a, this is going to be a yearly, um, annual event that we do hope in the future to make in person once this whole COVID thing passes over. But, uh, for this year, we still want the regions to start to take a look and, and see who we can put together, uh, in our teams. Um, where are we? Number six, you'll get fitter and more fabulous, more than you already are. Yes. Number five, it's the first time all four regions have ever had the chance to be involved in the same event on the same day. So that's pretty exciting for us. And like I said, in the future, we're gonna have it in person and it's gonna have the same concept. Uh, number four, the PAD staff team is already ahead of you. So for those of you in the group that are super competitive, you're already behind. Uh, number three, uh, we have a fabulous supporter, Lauren, doing a bike ride from Burnaby to Calgary. And if she can do that, I'm pretty sure you can do something. Um, number two, we have the opportunity to earn the PADS Top Dog Volunteer Award, which the, uh, goes out to top volunteer fundraisers. And this year's, <laughs> this year's recipient receives a barbecue dinner for you and six of your closest friends in the comfort of your own home or at one of the PADS facilities when, do, uh, when that's a, a possibility. And that'll be hosted by and bartended by our ED, Laura, DJed by me, Susie Suze, and also uh, we'll have uh, Chef Tara putting something very good for you. Um, and number one, the biggest reason of them all is more lives changed one dog at a time. So we do want to just encourage you to take a look at the e-blast, take a look at the event page, see what you can do. If you don't have the, um, the time uh, or the uh, movement goal in mind, you can also go and support many of the other people who have already started fundraising pages and support their causes too. Um, 
that is all I have on my end. I do think that Sarah, Susie, there's been a couple of questions. Do you mind if I just answer them quickly? Um, very quickly, because I'm just on break. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, somebody asked, or Tiff asked if um, some people are not part of PADS, can they join or make a team? Absolutely. So those yes. of you that have companies that love PADS, if they want to create a corporate team, this is open to anyone. And um, somebody else asked what happens, I think it was Emily, if you hit your donation goal, can you surpass it? You can, you can also increase it. Um, so if you set your goal at $1,000 and you hit it before you know it, you can set it to 5,000 if you want or whatever. So um, anybody can participate. Yes, absolutely. Um, and you know, the more creative you are on our social media or, or on any of your dog social media, honestly, people eat that up. So it's already been um, such like uh, an amazing outcome today. The blast went out and we already doubled our participant um, numbers and we're already 10%, I believe, towards our goal. So we're, we're definitely moving well and uh, getting everybody else's uh, pages up and running and support is, um, is the key right now. We do want to just mention um, our t-shirt orders in order to get the t-shirts out to everyone in a timely manner before the 19th, we have to cut off our orders on August 21st uh, for the t-shirts that, so please put in your t-shirt um, orders and uh, uh, your bandana orders, and we will make sure that those will go out to all of the regions by the first week um, or early second week of September, but everybody will have at least a week in the, in the flashy t-shirt and bandana combo. So you can uh, put that up on your social media and show, uh, show the communities what you're actually moving um, for. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally, um, Suzanne, are you on the call? Because Suzanne wanted to jump on here from the Lower Mainland. Are you <laughs> muted? <laughs> Um, so we started a Trails with Tails group here in the Lower Mainland. Um, so that's been put up on the um, BC Pads Facebook page for anybody who wants to join it or send it out to anyone else who wants to join it. We also would like to challenge the Okanagan and Calgary um, groups to get their own page up and running and we'll have a little bit of a competition going. Excellent. Excellent. Super friendly, COVID safe, all of the good stuff, right? Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, if anybody else has any other questions, um, by all means, shoot me an email um, and we can, uh, we can connect online. Um, but super excited for everyone to join us. If you are not interested in actually being a paid participant and you don't need the t-shirt, you don't need the dog bandana, you can actually join for free too. So um, the $40 uh, covers the actual shipping and the t-shirt and the dog bandana. So that's why we had to put a cost to it. But by no means is that mandatory. You can absolutely just fundraise and hit those uh, prize incentives and still get some pretty sweet swag if you come in uh, fundraising a lot. So thanks everyone for your time. I will get back uh, to my other job and talk to you all soon. Bye. Bye, Susie. Thank you. Um, before we flip over to Heather, Tara, there's one more question that you might be better able to answer than either of us. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't write down who asked it, but can the Tuesday classes be added to the Google Classrooms? And I think right now we have them active for seven days, um, but I think you're better able to answer the logistics. Are you wanting to actually load the videos, like just have them available longer term? Is that what we're asking? I think that's what was being asked, but I don't know if it's um, if people want them to refer back to, it was Laura Nelson was asking, if people want them back to refer back to or if the seven days gives people enough time or if people even know that they're up for seven days. Yeah, um, I mean, we've been posting them for seven days. If that's, if that's not enough, people want them to refer back to, then, I mean, we can do that. We were more just thinking that it wasn't stuff that was as long-term relevant. So um, yeah, um, pop me an email, anybody, who would like those available longer just so I can get a sense 
um, just time-wise, like the, the downloading, loading, et cetera, it all takes time and effort. Whereas with um, Zoom, we can just share the links and then have them expire seven days later. And it doesn't actually involve a ton of extra of, of work for us, but certainly if it's something that's gonna have value longer term, we're happy to do that if there's enough interest. So just pop me an email, Tara at PADS. Awesome. All right, Heather, um, there was one question that pertains to you and then you are welcome to jump into it. And that was, does the Okanagan have a check-in on Tuesday? And I'm on vacation, so I'm gonna leave that up to you. Uh, yeah, I'll check with Brian to see what your guys' regular check-in day is. And I will jump on for a check-in with you guys. Yeah. Not Wednesday morning though. Hmm? It won't be Wednesday morning next week. We know that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get a time that works for Brian. Um, and we will shoot you guys a note as to what day, uh, that will be But you guys. Yep. Yeah, for sure. We'll have a check-in. Okay. Um, so this week's class, um, I, I did some videos and I apologize if some of you guys got, uh, an assignment. I was right in the middle of, um, doing the post and my computer cord charger quit. I didn't realize that my computer died. And so some of you guys might have gotten the draft um, homework uh, thing might have uh, loaded on some of your guys' classes, I think. So uh, after tonight's class, they will be posted. And what there is, is there's two videos. There's one longer video uh, that Miranda and I took. Uh, just some ideas for you guys to, to play with with your off-leash stuff. Um, it, but it's a 20 minute video. So we didn't want to put it in as a prerequisite before class because it's a long one. And then the second one is a short five minute video, um, which will be your guys' homework this week. Uh, I'm really excited about that one. Um, I learned it from Force Mickey. I've learned a lot from him over the years and I've always struggled with kind of the concept of having our dogs uh, luring well and taking food with a lot of um, commitment and tenacity maybe, and then how to get the dogs nicer with taking food. And so the way Forrest Mickey, um, he has a kind of a, a new food process, uh, reward process, and it changes the picture. Um, so you have a lure hand, which the dogs can really be um, kind of what we've been building for quite a few years now of just like that really pushy, um, really intense uh, movement in the hand. And then into, um, it's more of like a finger picking style um, to where the dogs are a little more thoughtful. And the cool thing is we've, we've changed it a little bit. So Force Mickey used it a lot for duration and we will get there also, but how I've applied it and how I think it's gonna really help us is um, kind of creating a temperature check on arousal with our dogs and giving our dogs kind of a, um, a system that they can start to self-modulate. And you guys will understand more when you see the video. I don't wanna, uh, you know, use your time twice talking about the same thing, so. Um, that's kind of the the next few videos for you guys to watch for this week. Um, and the hope for this class was to kind of leave it open uh, for any questions you guys had about last week's class, because it was a little more um, geared towards stuff that Jackie knows um, a ton about. And so if there was questions that might not have been answered in your, your Q&A classes, if you guys had some um, that you wanted to direct uh, to Jackie, we could do that now. If there was other discussions about off-leash stuff, we could do that also. So I'll leave it for a minute. If you guys wanna feel free to jump on um, and ask your question. Okay, Nola has a question. Are you wanting us to send video doing same as the taking temperature video? She only unloads dogs into their garage. So the video homework is going to be um, the food delivery. Right, that's gonna be your only homework. The video that you might have seen part of while well, if it got up in your class before it was um, taken down till tonight was um, unloading and a, a few different ways to unload your dog. And so I would say, Nola, even if you're unloading in your garage, um, it's a good opportunity for you to just make sure that your dog is in the right zone uh, before they get in or out. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I, I'm all thumbs when I was trying to chat there. <laughs> so um, mm. 
anyway, uh, what I, what I, where I was going is that I, if he's off leash, I never ever unload him anywhere except behind a closed door or gate and we don't have a field, um, you know, where, where we can safely unload him. So, um, so the difference might be that you um, open your door or lift up your hatch and then work um, for a few minutes within your vehicle. Um, yeah. Just until you get, you know, once you guys play with the food delivery, I think you'll, your dogs will catch on pretty quick and you'll really be able to temperature gauge how they're doing. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So anything we've kind of done up until this point, uh, the more you guys play with it, the more, uh, you will start to see it, it lends itself to all different scenarios. And so um, trying to generalize some of the new stuff right now might be kind of tricky. Um, but once you get playing with it a little bit, you'll start to see that name game lends itself to, you know, hundreds of, uh, of different um, scenarios and um, ways to help you out of trouble. Um, same as engagement, that sort of stuff. So it's just something to think about and and what the hope is, is that you guys watch a video. It's 20 minutes, so it's a bit long. But then within that 20 minutes, you start to see um, some ways that you can maybe apply it to your situation. Because, yeah, I know um, lots of people don't have a great big old field like I do. Um, but uh, that was one, you know, we used the field because we could unload the dogs in a really um, controlled fashion. And then we could let them loose um, probably pretty similar to what most dogs come out of the car and into the gate of a typical off-leash area too. So um, that, that's kind of the hope is you guys watch the videos and then you look for ways to apply it to your situation, I think. Does that, that was, answer your question? Yeah, pretty impressive with four dogs. Well, and I just want to clarify for people who haven't seen the video, the intention was not for it to be published. So the people that have seen it have managed to skip ahead, but it's not that everybody was supposed to get it before the class. So don't worry, you're not missing out. The intention all along has been that it gets delivered after the class. Yeah, I actually we had to do an SOS and, and beg someone to delete it because I <laughs> had a catastrophe with my internet and everything. That's why I'm sitting on a phone. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, if, if maybe we'll leave some of the other questions uh, till later if we have more questions about that. But um, yeah, the hope is just that you guys Take in the info and then look for ways to apply it within your yeah. own situation. Yeah, we played with it a bit in the garage and, and then into the backyard and, instead of into a field. So anyway. Awesome, that's great. Okay, so is there any more questions about maybe anything you guys want to ask Jackie about last week? Um, there will be more videos coming in the next little while. And I'll maybe talk about your, the form you guys all sent in to us um, after we give you guys a chance to ask Jackie any questions you might have from, from last week. So I'll give you guys a few, um, a minute or so to speak up uh, if you've got questions and then we'll, we'll carry on. Oh, and then she really disappears. She just puts her computer into blank mode and... Jackie. Oh, I didn't. I need to do that. No, nope, go ahead. Um, I have a question. It's uh, I asked after you did the first class and you had this great slide deck that you used with us. Can you upload that to our classrooms? Because it yes. was fabulous, and I was trying to take notes and trying to pay attention, but I don't think I got all the information that I could get from that. So, if that would be great. I have it on my to-do list. I've had the flu this week. It is not COVID, so that's no good. Problem. So it no is there. Problem. I will get to it. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. No worries. And I did put up last night into everybody's class uh, the list of resources from last week. So for anybody who really wants to geek out, it is there. Thank you. Okay. Well, we'll get going. And if you guys think of anything, um, Put your hand up or, or jump in. Um, so this week, uh, when I was going through the forms, there was a lot of people who really wanted more resources on recalls. And so we have um, kind of decided as a group that we will continue to, to teach some of this great big stuff as regional stuff. Um, 
the recalls are very, very complicated. And so we're gonna take some bite-sized um, chunks off, uh, but we've done a lot of the back work already with the engagement um, sessions before, and also the dog-dog interaction stuff. So um, in time to come, we will be working on like a go say hi, where dogs are greeting um, each other and other people on leash. Um, we'll also be working on um, just some recall games. And we've also had, I got some really nice video from your guys' uh, The Expert panel. So some of uh, the things that those guys do um, kind of on a daily basis or weekly basis whenever they go to the park um, and some games and stuff that they're doing uh, in their yard. So um, they're kind of starting to come in now. So I'm, I'm excited to share that with you guys. Um, but I guess we just kind of wanted to dig in to um, more of the recall stuff, but not not so much that, that you guys think that you can do one aspect or one skill or one game and be able to take an adolescent dog to the dog park and be successful. So Jackie, do you want to jump in on um, just kind of some of the adolescent stuff and where that might tie directly into the off-leash park or did you cover that kind of as much as you wanted to last week? I think I covered it kind of as much as I wanted to last week. Um, yeah, I think, I think we're good there. Okay, so when we, when we start looking at the things that we've done in the past, we're really hoping you guys continue working on some of that stuff. The biggest challenges with Off Leash Park is usually we are entering that zone or that area with the dogs kind of over the top already. And it's almost impossible at that point to kind of get them back down. So we call it self-modulation and it is usually something that dogs um, naturally just have a hard time with. There's very few dogs, and Jackie, you can jump in too. There's very few dogs that can go from zero to 100, that, that big spike, and then come all the way down that spike quickly themselves. A lot of times you need to take um, some space. A lot of times you need to take a little bit of a chill and just relax and reset. And so with the 20 minute video, I think you guys will really see the importance of starting it out correctly. And that's your best bet. And so um, if you guys have had some time now um, between the when we had the expert panel class and now to kind of come up with some maybe some questions around how you might orientate your walk or who you might go with. If you guys want to ask questions about that um, for any, um, you know, if we can help you with that at all. Uh, but really, it's just I, we don't want to throw more at you guys than what we have already but just enough that you can start to really start taking in a bunch of stuff and then applying it to your own situation because they're all very, very different. Um, but the key this week is just about the mindset going in. So I think the food delivery, you guys are really going to like. I, you know, where has it been all my life kind of thing. It's, it's quite good. Um, so it seems like we're not going to cover a whole bunch um, in this class, but there's a lot for you guys to watch right after class. Um, so I'll, I'll open it up to some questions that you guys might have um, that we can maybe help you with understanding some of that other stuff. Do you guys have any? No, we're good right now, but I can jump in. So uh, Heather and I can play tip tennis a little bit and give you guys some pointers. So um, Heather was talking about in terms of dogs going into arousal and staying in arousal. And, you know, if we can, you know, kind of for the past several weeks, the homework has been go away and think of what the top five things are that you need to be successful at the dog park. And so, you know, personally, when I'm taking my dogs to the dog park, I want to build in those, you know, we're getting aroused and then we're managing to self-regulate. And so building times into your off-leash so it's not just I go and I party the whole time and I come home exhausted. Um, and I don't think it was in class. I think it was in our, our team call this week. But, you know, we all probably know people that you go to a party and you know that, you know, this one friend is going to be the person whose spouse is dragging them out 
at the end of the night and that they haven't behaved at their best, their spouse is embarrassed, you know, things have kind of gone way over the top. That's not the position we want to put our dogs in. And so to practice, um, you know, going up into arousal and then doing something that's lower arousal. So whether we do a recall and then we do a little bit of, you know, the dog's still off leash, but we do a little bit of engagement games to kind of settle them down and then we let them go again. Or whether we call them back on a trail walk and we put them on leash for a little bit and we practice our heels and sides while we're moving and some obedience and then we let them go again. So that we're building in that rhythm of, um, you know, I can go up and then I can bring myself back into self-regulation if I've asked. And then I can go up and I can bring myself back into self-modulation rather than just hitting the top of that arousal curve that we talked about last week and coming down the other side into absolutely unproductive arousal. That dog's going to be leaving the dog park um, with an embarrassed uh, partner, right? So, um, you know, that would be kind of one of the things to think about as you're putting together your list of what you need to be successful is how do you build in those lower arousal moments or those lower arousal um, activities into your off-leash time so that it's not just, hey, we hit the off-leash park and we party. And we, you know, we were talking a bit about too as a team um, in terms of there's something as a handler that's so compelling about joy and watching our dogs be joyful and watching our dogs playing. And um, I think that, you know, speaking to you guys and seeing the concerns that come up on puppy reports and stuff, I think that everybody's pretty aware of the line where the unbridled joy turns into a problem and things go south. And um, so, you know, we were kind of discussing it in terms of you know, if you look at it from a mental health perspective, right? We, as people, we do not live our lives in unbridled joy, just waiting at that tipping point for things to go down. You know, there's moments of joy and then there's moments of contentment where things are going well, but it's not that, you know, like intense joy all the time. And so, you know, trying to watch when your dogs are in those lower arousal activities or, you know, whether it's leash walks or whether you go to the off-leash trails and there's no other dogs and you and your dog just have you know, an off-leash walk together, kind of really being mindful of, even if it's not over the top crazy joy, those really kind of content, you know, um, times when the dog's really refilling their cup, right? They are, fill, they are, they are kind of, if you're somebody who loves being in nature, you know, that time that you hit the forest and your feet hit the ground, it's just, ah, our dogs experience that too. So just really tuning into that and appreciating that as being really important to our dog's mental health as well. Well, and I think there's something to it when we see dogs running around like their tails are on fire, it makes it look like they're having a great time. And they probably are, right? They are ha they're unleashed, they're having a great time. Um, but I think we all, we might not, not kind of line it up that when my dog is meandering on a trail and they have their nose down and they're just tootling along. Um, I think we, we tend to think the dog running around with their tail on fire is having more fun than the dog just kind of tootling along. And, <clears throat> and I don't know, I mean, I feel kind of the same way sometimes, right? I, I want my dogs to just go have a good old run. Um, but there's something to that too. So you know, I think when you guys watch the video and you see the, the, the dogs having a great time, um, not being productive, they were exhausted after that, right? So they came out, <clears throat> excuse me, they chilled out for a while and they were very happy. Um, and then they had like this burst of like over arousal. And it's kind of like when your kids get round up and then you remember when your grandma or your mom or aunts or uncles or someone would be like, someone's going to get hurt. And it never failed that someone gets hurt because you're not being real productive, right? You're not um, not thinking things through great because it's going so fast. That's kind of what all these dogs did at the end of of a little bit of a like a, a whiz around. And so I think when we're thinking and talking about biological fulfillment, um, yeah, I mean it's a discussion I think we need to to have and, and to think why do we feel like our dogs are having more fun when they are really um, highly aroused and kind of running like they're 
you know, like the little zoomies. Is there any questions from people so far about yeah. any of that stuff? We have a really thoughtful two-part question that's come in anonymously, um, which I think is really good. It takes the discussion kind of to some of the places that we've talked about. Um, so the first part of the question is, should good recall be there before dogs go to the off-leash park? And the second part of the question is, do the off-leash parks and trips contribute to high dog destruction? Yeah, those are great questions. So <clears throat> if you go to the dog park or an off-leash area and you don't have a recall, there are very few things that are, you're going to be able to teach well in a higher arousal state. And so there's, Jackie, did you kind of talk about that perfect belt, like the, the arousal? We talked about being in drive at the peak point of arousal and then how things start to decompensate from there. Yeah, so a dog needs to kind of be in that kind of that sweet spot for that, that think and learn zone, that school zone um, kind of a mentality where they can um, take in information. So if you're going into a dog park um, or at any kind of area, so Jackie and I both have puppies right now. I have um, a little golden retriever. And when he's out on walks, he's a little worried. And so for me to teach him um, a recall would be more stress on him than if I were to play with it in a really controlled environment because he's a little bit worried, but it's arousal nonetheless, right? Jackie's got a little dog. He's a little bit more activated. For her to teach him a recall out and about would be, Jackie, what would that be like? There's no way. I would be less interesting than everything else in the world. And if put in the comments, uh, it's the, you know, watch, hold my beer and watch this. That would be him. That would be the last time I saw him for the whole outing until I managed to catch him at the dog park. Yeah. And so Susan Garrett has this great sentence and she says hope training, right? So what hope training is, is doing the same thing and hoping for a different out outcome. And that's kind of what I feel like if you go to an off-leash park without a recall, uh, you're just being really hopeful that it's gonna, gonna come back around. And so um, does that mean you can't take them to an off-leash park? Um, it means you have to be really, really careful um, where you go and what that looks like, the time of day. It looks like possibly having a long line on your dog. Um, they can be tricky for some dogs and some people to handle. Um, so I would much rather have my, my recall kind of solidified um, because when we're thinking about um, escalating um, one of our Ds, so our distance, duration, um, or distraction, your distraction is going to be so high um, that your expectations of a recall is going to be the very beginning of that recall, which is just a head turn, right? So what I would do with a young puppy is I would have them on a long line and I would show up to my dog park and I would do name game and I would pay, 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 pay. But I wouldn't let them out farther because I wouldn't teach a recall at the beginning that way. So just remember you're working on one D at a time. So when you go to the dog park, you have a really big distraction. And so the distance and duration are, cannot be um, worked on. It has to be one at a time. Does that make sense? The next part of the question is what? Does, uh, do off-leash dog parks and trips contribute to high dog distraction? It all depends how your dog is acquiring with the reinforcer, right? If your dog is acquiring a reinforcer inappropriately, it doesn't matter if you go once a year, it doesn't matter if you go once, you know, once a day. Um, whatever your dog is being rewarded for will become stronger and stronger. So it doesn't change if a dog has more dog motivation. Um, it just depends on the behaviors that you're building leading up to, to getting towards that dog. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Jackie? Just, you've talked about building a couple times, and I think that's something really important to kind of drill down into is that um, I think for Heather, for myself, um, you know, for the other trainers, how we're handling this when we have pads dogs at our home is that there are kind of core competencies that we want to be on board before we take the dog to the dog park. You know, we kind of, I'm really hard pressed to consider any place that's going to be a bigger challenge for the dog, right? So I want to make sure, you know, things like you know, when we're on leash, do I have engagement? You know, if we're on leash and we pass another dog on the opposite side of the street, do I maintain engagement? Um, 
you know, do, if I've got two dogs playing in a yard, you know, can I recall them? Because if I can't recall my two dogs who know each other from the backyard, chances are I'm not going to be successful at a dog park. And so I'm kind of using these things as my metrics for, you know, do I think that I could get my dog back at the dog park? And, you know, to be honest, like I would be pretty confident at this point saying I can walk my pads, my teenager at least, possibly my puppy down the leash, the, down the road with no leash and I would be okay and they would stay with me. Um, so I want to know that I have those kind of building blocks in place before I put them in an environment that's going to really challenge them. And Cherie pointed out, uh, there's a new dog park in the Okanagan nobody goes to, so it's a great place to take a couple dogs to practice. Um, I mean, for, for puppy raisers that don't have yards, this would be potentially a place where, you know, rather than throwing your, your dog in at the deep end, so to speak, you say, hey, you know, is there somebody else that has a yard that would be willing to have, like, my dog come over and we practice two dogs at a time? Can we get recalls going? Or can we do three dogs at a time and get recalls going? and really make sure that you've got that nice strong foundation. Um, there's also places sometimes for working behind barriers and Tiff took some videos of that last week that I haven't had a chance to edit yet but when we were doing assessments we were using a 15 week old puppy as the distraction dog and his job is not to interact with the other dogs whatsoever just to be there as kind of like hey there's a dog in the environment and see how intense they are and so we're working him behind the barrier. He has no chance to accidentally reinforce himself by getting to the other dog, just as the dogs in an assessment have no chance to accidentally reinforce themselves by getting to him. Um, and so we're really cementing that, you know, there is no other option for reinforcement. The only reinforcement comes from reorienting to me. So I think, you know, going back to what Heather said about that, you know, the, those things that you want to have in place, like really be mindful of, do I feel like I can, can do these things when they're separate from each other before I combine them all together into a big mixing pot. Um, and I'm just gonna jump down for a sec. Cherie, maybe you could put in the comments, somebody was asking, where is the new Kelowna Park? So if you can just pop that in the, in the chat, that would be great. And then- uh, Just one, one thing when you guys are, um, when you're finding areas that very few people frequent, or that there's certain times of day that there's no one there. Just be thoughtful because I got in trouble years ago. Um, I was taking a young dog to an area that, that I thought was like, oh, no one even knows what it is. The same type of people that don't have great dogs, um, that don't interact with dogs well, they also seek out those types of environments. So just keep an eye on that, which I'm sure that that's not, uh, you know, the new dog park, um, but just keep, a uh, keep that in mind. Okay, uh, Kevin has a question. Is not taking your pup to an off-leash park detrimental to their general development? Do you want to talk about um, physical development, Jackie, on that one? And then I can finish up with the training side of it. So from a physical development point of view, um, you know, exercise is something that we kind of want to keep really defined boundaries on. And so, you know, on the hydrant, we have the exercise guidelines. Um, if people aren't familiar with where they are and you want me to go in and pop them into the resources I put up yesterday, I can do that. But, you know, it's always a bit of a balancing act between what the dog needs and what's too much. So, you know, it is very good for the dogs to have some stretched out loping type of, of running. Um, but, you know, that crazy body slamming exercise is not great for them. So, you know, it, from a, from a health point of view, you want to make sure your dog's getting exercise. The more varied exercise you can give your dog, the better. So, you know, if they're moving always in a straight motion and a walk, you know, they're not, they're not cross training in terms of, you know, if they twist something one way that's not in normal front and back mo movement, are they more likely to hurt themselves? So, you know, yes, it's great for them to have chance to run off the leash in terms of it being at an off leash park. It really depends on the type of play that's going on there. And, you know, to what Heather is going to speak about, um, you know, is it going to benefit their training or is it going to really set them back? Yeah. I mean, it, it's so, it's really hard to answer that question because 
it is going to only be really contingent upon what the dog's being reinforced for and what behaviors they're exhibiting is going to to be the detriment right so if a dog is over roused uh what was that what was the phrase the, the labra train um you know if they're doing that kind of behavior they're practicing it they they start to you know blow people off they start to get rough with other dogs all those you know sorts of things that is more of a detriment for them being a, an assistance dog candidate than a dog who's never experienced one right so it it is whether the dog's taking left or right turns uh whether they're you know making good choices whether we're helping them make good choices is going to, to determine whether that's a detriment or not is that anything you want to add um, any class trainers, if you guys want to jump in on any of this stuff, um, make sure you, I'm on a phone, so I, I only see um, Jackie. So if you guys got anything, uh, make sure you jump in and, and uh, add some more stuff in. All right. Um, Emily asks, are there behaviors learned in dog parks that can lead to puppies failing as assistance dogs? I think we kind of covered that one yeah. pretty well. Yeah. Um, uh, Carol says, I have a Is it mine that's frozen? No, I think it's Jackie. I think Jackie's frozen. Okay. Okay. I can't see the chat. I can read it. It just says, um, can, uh, my question about finding poop at the dog park can be a public question. Others must have a scrounger. I don't know what that was referring to, but. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, if we have dogs who are, um, you know, scavenging for poop, <clears throat> Jackie's computer crashed. She's just rebooting. Um, if you have a dog who is, um, you know, kind of notorious to, to taking off and getting into the trees or, or finding other, um, you know, inappropriate things to eat, what I like to do is condition them all to uh, a rubber open muzzle. Um, and it just allows them to, you know, for the most part, not be able to get self rewarded for picking things up and eating it. It also, um, gives you the time to have kind of a successful trip because the thing with like a poop eater or something like that is you can help them when when they're you're like four or five feet away um, but they learn quickly that once they're farther away um, or if they eat it quicker um, that you can't uh, help them out with that so um, it just kind of gives them the context that they can be farther away it doesn't matter and they still can't get it and you can pay good decisions so hopefully that's kind of what you were, um, what you were asking about. Tara, there is a question. Sorry, did you say, up. did you say a, a, a muzzle? Yes. Yeah, so, a muzzle. so the question I have is, is a lot of people who talk about dogs eating sticks. Is that a, is that a option for people who, whose dogs like to eat sticks? And they yeah, obviously don't sure. want them to eat them sticks. Yeah, I I really like to condition all the dogs to wearing some kind of something on their face, um, so we can um, we can post some videos on kind of how to get your dog you know um, okay with putting their nose in certain um, healthies and and uh, muzzles and that sort of thing. But yeah, if you are having a problem with your dog, you know, picking up sticks or or chewing on them or eating things like that, um, for sure we can we can do that. A lot of people are, um, don't like putting a muzzle on their dog at the dog park just cause you know what people might think about it. But, um, I've had lots of good feedback of people. Um, you guys can relax a little bit too, right? You guys can, uh, can know that your dog's not going to eat some, something that they shouldn't and get sick or, or, um, ingest a bunch of wood or something like that. So we can, um, get some resources going for you guys. Sorry, I'm back. My computer crashed. No, it's okay. There was a question, Tara, um, about the difference between sitters and raisers taking the same dog to the park. Can you read that one for Jackie? Yeah, it says, can you talk about the differences between a sitter and raiser taking a dog off leash, the same dog? Okay. 
Um, it depends how well that person knows a dog. Um, because especially our golden retrievers tend to be a little more relational than some of our labs, um, but not always. Um, so if you have a dog, even if I give you my dog and I say they're great off leash, I will typically finish that sentence with saying with me. And so we want you guys, um, if you've had the dog before, you have a good relationship with the dog, you spend enough time with the dog to know like their ins and outs, um, then that's different. But if it's a dog that you don't know, um, no, no dog park for a while until you get a relationship with the dog because you need to know if they're coming back. They need to know that you're good um, for paying them for coming back. So there's a, a relationship piece there that, that is probably not there um, the same as if you were their razor. Uh, Nola asks, what about a muzzle in the backyard so he can't sticks, can't get sticks? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so the muzzle is going to be um, similar to like a halty, right? We don't want to have a dog who's uh, ready for placement with a client that we say, oh, they can't go, you know, out of your sight, um, or not out of your sight, but say off leash without a muzzle on because that, you know, it doesn't, uh, we can't transfer that. And so it's going to be a training tool in a period of time that you need to build some, some new um, patterns with. And so, yeah, if you have a dog who's eating sticks and, and all sorts of stuff in your backyard, by all means, yep. You have to do it very carefully. Um, and we will post, um, I'm not going to tell you it's going to happen this week, but we will post some videos on kind of how you guys get your dogs um, liking and feeling good about the muzzle and then also the options that we would uh, suggest for you guys to to put on your dogs. And then just a reminder too that a muzzle is management and so we talked about last week so Heather's saying you know it's like a halty it's like a harness for for no pulling. Um, we talked about last week in the adolescent class the things about management is it doesn't fix the problem and it's there to help you help prevent the dog from rehearsing the problem while you work at the fix. So you don't want to just use the muzzle and not work on the fix. Um, so golden retrievers who have behavior issues with sitters that the razor doesn't experience themselves. Does that mean that they should place the dog with sitters more frequently so that they can get used to different individuals? It would depend what, what type of um, concerns we're having, right? Um, so I'd, I'd need to know a little bit more before giving that answer. Um, yeah, so I'll wait. If you guys have um, some examples, then that would be helpful too. I'd say too, we've been having some kind of just preliminary discussions recently in terms of attachment and um, both within our organization and I think also, it was within the, the puppy raising trainers um, at the Assistance Dogs International level in terms of dogs who display hyperattachment rather than separation anxiety, really what they are worried about is they're worried about not being with their person. And some discussion about whether that is worse at specific ages or if the dogs don't have, you know, a solid attachment at specific ages. So. I think as Heather was saying, it is really specific to what problems that the dog is experiencing and uh, kind of what age they are as well in terms of are they better off creating that really solid bond um, with their primary handler and holding off on sending them to sitters for a while or are they going to be better off getting handled by multiple people? Yeah, the one, the one way we would maybe think that we need to have handlers, um, different handlers work a dog. So my little golden puppy, he's quite attached to me. And what quite attached to me looks like is he's very much, um, where's Heather at? And he's very much lay at my feet. He's very much, um, when we're on an off leash walk, he's very much looking at me um, a good part of the time. So what that tells me is that he finds a lot of uh, maybe some comfort, maybe pulls a lot of confidence from me. And so I want to make sure that he will 
recall with my kids. So I do some drills with him. They will feed him and do some training sessions. Um, there's another razor, her and I go back and forth with him, but it's not just moving him to different people. It's allowing him to know that, oh, this person will support me in the same way as that person. But it's a very, it's not like more people, like the more the merrier. It's about, this is what he needs. He needs someone um, that can be supporting to him in the same way, in the same type of context. And it's not just, you know, Heather's the person and I can't do it for anyone else. So that's just one example. So I'm just thinking there's no more questions in the chat and we're coming up close to seven. Do you want to go over a little bit about the responses from uh, last week's survey? Because I don't want to lose out on the opportunity to do that before we sign off. Oh, you're muted. So I don't have my computer. My computer is not on. I couldn't get a charge. So I'm wondering if without the names, if you guys were interested in seeing, um, you know, a lot of the people's feedback, I'll go through it really quick. A lot of people's feedback, um, there was overwhelmingly, uh, people really appreciated having the razors, um, the expert panel, the sitters and razors on that um, class. They really liked having Sarah on there and kind of hearing about how she navigates off these parks um, and that, you know, she kind of closed the circle. Um, there was a lot of feedback about people are seeing the importance of a really reliable recall. Um, there was a lot of people actually that feel relieved that them feeling uncomfortable being at the off-leash park was not detrimental. If they don't go, um, they're finding other ways to kind of build some of the skills that we might think are a necessity off-leash. Um, there was a lot of people seeking for um, help with recalls, with getting your dog back um, when they're kind of getting into trouble or being inappropriate with other dogs. And so we've, I've taken all that feedback and we will be building those little um, training videos for you guys. Um, and I, I did get the feeling that a lot of people thought that there was like a few magic bullets that might uh, make their off-leash experience really good. And what the magic recipe is, is engagement, you guys being able to manage your environment and the resources that you have available and how your dog acquires them. And that takes a lot of work. And it also takes a lot of time to be able to generalize what you've learned in name game and where you can apply it to all sorts of different problems that maybe pop up or mark and move and that sort of thing. So um, without having them all in front of me, that was kind of the gist. And so we took, like there was probably 40% of people wanted to know more about uh, recalls. So we're going to dig a little bit more into that. And so we'll see how you guys are feeling, um, you know, with the, the 20 minute video, and then we'll get into some go say hi and how um, we'd like to see it done. And then some go play and some go sniff. So those are some things that are coming up. Did I tell you anything, Jackie, that I'm forgetting to mention right now? I don't think so. I think kind of just to sum up in a different way, what you're saying, because sometimes that helps is, um, with recall and with a lot of different behavior problems, like one of our, um, the outcome that we were looking for in the trainer's toolkit is really empowering you guys to say, okay, um, there isn't like a plug and play response to every problem, right? So it's not a, I'm having a problem with recall at the park and therefore, as Heather said, here's X, Y, Z, go to the park and it's going to be fine. It's more, you know, these are the crucial foundation blocks. And so if behavior at the park isn't what I want it to be, then I need to go back and work on these different things outside of the park and then bring it back. And so it's not a case of fixing something that's broken in an equation to get a recall. It's more of a case of building that really strong foundation so that when you go to the park, you know, your recall works, but equally those same skills are going to, to, you know, stand you in good stead for something completely different that it goes back to those same fundamental behaviors that the dogs are offering. And, um, you know, 
possibly you guys have noticed at this point, like when you're getting feedback from us a lot of the times, it's go back to this engagement exercise, go back to this engagement exercise, go back to this engagement exercise, because a lot of the times it is that, um, you know, just going back to those fundamentals and it doesn't matter whether, you know, your problem is um, my dog likes to, uh, you know, crotch sniff people in public or my dog um, doesn't come back at the off leash park. Either one of those, you know, still is going to be really benefited by engagement. So, you know, it is, it is just that with struggles, it's not going to be a plug and play, which should be heartening because it means that you only have to master a small number of skills rather than having to have a different set of skills for recall and a different set of skills because your dog um, is chewing things it shouldn't and a different set of skills because your dog uh, you know, is, is jumping up on people. Um, you know, it's a relatively small group of behaviors and it's then just being able to generalize that out to how it's going to um, affect your bigger picture. Um, Ken, Ken Ramirez, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Foundation's done really well. So the name game can make or break your off leash, really. And it can also help us get um, stimulus control on really complex behaviors so it is starts at the very beginning and it goes all the way to the end so a lot of this stuff so well said jackie um and then sheree has a question what need is being met by stick chewing that we can meet another way i chewing, have no idea chewing often is a calming behavior and so um, Unless it's a dismantling. Is, calm is one of the behaviors that we haven't really dug into in the trainer's toolkit right now. And it's one of the things that I am working on pulling resources together for right now because I'm, I think I've told you guys before, I'm working on a unit for Barky Dogs. And calm is a huge part of Barky Dogs. It's a huge part of over-aroused dogs, dogs that have really poor tolerance to frustration. So those are our demand barkers. Um, and so you know, stick chewing is a way for dogs to calm down often. So that can be met with, you know, frozen Kongs on a bed with Nyla bones, that sort of thing. But it's a, it's a matter of relocating the behavior to where it's appropriate and to an item that's appropriate. But, you know, it, it's, really good because it's the dog showing you, you know, this is kind of what I need for my mental wellness right now. Well, great. So then it's just a case of a negotiation for this is where it's okay for you to do this um, rather than like, no, don't chew at all. Like, oh, great. That helps you calm down. Fantastic. You know, here's where we're going to do that behavior instead. There is some dogs who just want to dismantle things. So I'm not sure. Um, um what i mean there's just certain dogs i i have one of my melanois um she will just dismantle a stick and that that is very different than you know a dog chewing um in a bit of a more um, thoughtful way she's like she just wants to wreck something and so dogs who like to chew versus dogs who like to de-stuff a toy um and maybe we'll get into kind of some of that stuff also later and in that case, Heather, you're looking at as that as a high arousal behavior, right? When she's doing that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's almost like, a, you know, she gets highly aroused and she, you know, she'll just, um, you know, run, run partway up a tree and grab a stick and hang off it and thrash around and chew on it. And so there, there's off. different labs doing that. We're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. But, but some dogs, you see them like holding something in between their teeth and like pulling it up and trying to rip it apart. Um, that's a little bit different and we do have some um, I think it's Porter is a really intense chewer always has been um, and we find that um, some of those puppies just are really intense chewers so it, it, it kind of depends on how they're they're built too um, and kind of what they like to do for fun um, I have other dogs who they won't they don't like chewing they don't chew on anything so it's just gonna you know it's one of those things that you kind of want to look with the intensity behind it, I think also. And it depends on the age of your puppy because for instance, 
you know, if Freddie decides he's going to chew on my coffee table, which he's done a sum total of twice, then for me, that's like, no, nope, we're over aroused. We're going into our kennel for some downtime. So, you know, be mindful too of what age your puppy is and what that's telling you about their emotional state at the time. Cool. So Jackie, we're at um, five minutes after. Um, what we will, um, I just want to recap. So your guys' homework will be posted in your classes um, right away. Um, it'll just, uh, it's supposed to be at nine. So in about an hour. Um, and you guys can go back and watch those videos. And then you're going to be submitting the, the food delivery um, with Force Mickey in your class for your um, teachers to have a look at. Uh, when I talked to Force Mickey this week, he was really excited for everyone to be doing it. And so I would really like, excuse me, anyone who has good success or wants to share, maybe your guys' uh, the beginning of the food delivery and maybe a short little clip of what that looks like after a few days. And he would really like us to tag him in his Instagram. So I'd love to help him out that way. Um, just because I paid for the video, but he's given it to us um, for everyone for free. So that's pretty cool. Awesome. And then before we get to any questions, um, you know, because we're reaching that point where if people want to sign off, they're welcome to. Uh, I just wanted to go through, there was one question that came in this week about um, there's so much stuff coming at people. What do you need to review? So you only have to come for the first hour when we have Thursday night classes. The question and answer afterwards, you are welcome to leave. I know people find it interesting and like to stick around, but please don't feel like you have to. Um, anything that is posted to Facebook is posted strictly as a, if people are interested in this, read it. It is not required reading. There is no expectation if it's on Facebook that you have watched it, read it, absorbed it. It is just there for the people who really like that extra geeky stuff. Um, and I believe Tara, I think you're still on the call. I believe Tara said that the stuff that's posted on Facebook during the week gets summarized in the e-blast. Am I right, Tara? Yeah. So if you post something like an article or blog post, um, I usually put a link to it in the e-blast so that anybody that's not on Facebook still gets the opportunity to go, oh, that looks interesting. I'll read it. So so if you're worried because you're missing it because it's on Facebook, the reason it's on Facebook and not Google Classrooms is because it's not required. Like but you're welcome to go back and review it. And Tara has provided those links for everybody. Um, and then, so the only things that are really required are the first hour of Thursday class. It's great if you can come to Tuesday. I think, especially as we're moving towards Tuesday being the primary class, please do come to Tuesdays. Um, and then what's in your Google Classroom. So that is all that is you know, required. The other stuff is just out there because we have some people who are you know, really craving additional information or craving a bit more of a deep dive, um, but you know, don't feel like you have to you know, watch the 15 minute video of the talk show that I post on Facebook. Like that is not required information. It's just there kind of as a, as a tool for people who want a little bit more. Um, and Tara, Tara, just to clarify, you're only putting the things that Jackie posts in there uh, for links, correct? Yep. Okay. I just yep. didn't want people thinking that all, everyone that was posting a training. No, no, no. So like if, if there's stuff right. that's posted by puppy raisers, et cetera, I wouldn't be sharing that. Just anything that's shared by Jackie or... Um, you know, shared a couple. Pardon? Dana shared a couple. She has. And so like for the staff, if something's shared by one of the, the training staff, I usually would run that by um, Heather and Jackie just to see if it should be included or not. So. Okay. So for anybody who needs to sign off, that is the end of our regular. Oh, sorry. Nope. I have one more thing I wanted to remember to say. Um, there have been requests for a glossary. I had promised you guys I was working on it when I went on holidays no. last month. I have worked on it. Tara has a copy of it as it stands so far. Um, and I believe, Tara, it's going to go as a PDF next week. Is that correct? Okay. And it'd be included in this week's eBlast just as a PDF. But just so everybody knows, um, the Hydrant actually supports a glossary. So, like, we're like, it'll show up as like a little tool tip. So that's the end game. But for now, we're just going to distribute the glossary 
Um, and so it won't be on Hydra, and it'll just be a PDF in your email for now. Um, and then um, once I'm back from holidays, we'll work on getting it up on Hydra. Is that something that we can put in Google Classrooms? Yeah, for sure you can. Awesome. All right. So that is actually the end of our scheduled time. So if people have questions, feel free to stick around and ask. Um, otherwise, thank you guys. And uh, we will not see you back on Thursday for several weeks. But do remember to check the eblast. It will have it all laid out for you so you'll know where you're supposed to be and when. All right, Heather, there is a question. Veronica uh, and Ross ask, would keep away tie in with recall work? Yeah, so keep away, because um, keep away is a dog moving away. Uh, recall work is a dog moving towards. And so um, it's all part and parcel. So if you have a dog who's playing keep away, you want to be really careful um, what resources are taking um, and what that looks like trying to get it back. So if I have a dog out in an area and I'm trying to recall them, they I'm trying to get a hold of them, I can't catch them, you're going to move away. So don't move towards it. You're going to run away. It's going to be about the same. So if you have, say, if your dog's playing keep away with shoes in your house, you're going to be really careful with where your shoes are at, how, they, how can they access them. Um, if it's something like a toy and you want them to bring it back to you or you want to be able to walk up and trade them for it, um, you're going to be really thoughtful about how the dog thinks that game ends or starts and so um, if it's a big problem reach out to your class trainer and we'll come up with some uh, tips for you. Does that answer your question? Did that answer the question? Do we know Jackie? Uh, that, sorry I was scrolling down so uh, they say only ever clumps of grass and the occasional stick. Mm. Yeah. So what's happening is the dog picks something up and they're trying to get it and the dog takes off. I'm guessing. I would work on that. Ross and Veronica, uh, do you want to take yourselves off mute and just you can ask your question then? Um, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, this has been something from day one with her. It's gotten a lot better. But um, yeah, she'll, she'll all of a sudden find this clump of grass and it's like, um, she'll either try to eat it in two seconds, like just about choking it down, or she'll do the start, you know how puppies will play with the, you know, they put their, their paws down and start kind of, it's like she, she's taunting us to come get me, you know, and um, so it, it particularly happens in the backyard. And um, so what we've done a lot is started tethering her in the backyard because if, you know, if you can't, you can't tell the line, then as Dana would say, sex to be you, you're on the tether. Um, she's great on the trail. We took her to the off-leash park with Terry. She was fine. Like she won't do it other than in our backyard or occasionally in the park around the corner. Again, if they just cut the lawn, right? Um, she'll find a clump. So super frustrating. Um, not sure really what to do about it because she does have, from everything we've seen, a solid recall. Just, just these you know times when she finds the, the clumps of grass or an occasional stick. Yeah, I think probably um, if we ask her what she thought the process looked like for when she had that item in her mouth she probably finds it really valuable for people to move towards her and it's a bit of a game. And, and so her making the movement away from you starts a big fun game for her. So what I would do is I would have her on a long line or a leash um, and I might uh, say her name. I'd practice the name game a lot and I'd practice that mark and move. So when I used her name, as soon as she looked at me, I would mark and I would run the opposite way. And when she showed up, I'd pay her really, really heavily. And then I let her go play again and just um, cycle through a few of those and just see. Yeah. What I've been doing lately is I've been going, as soon as the instant she looks at me, I'll go good. Cause to her good means kibble. 
So she, as soon as she hears me hear, say good, she'll, she'll start running to me like for her payout, right? So it's, I know that's not the correct way to do it, but it's kind of the only way that I can get her to, oh, you said good, I'm coming, where's my treat, you know? So yes should have, um, yes should really be her uh, word for her to break that position and, and meet up with you. And so when you say, um, say her name first, so yeah. that, because it, so say if she believes that good is a marker um, that marks the second in time that she did something correct and that food's coming, yeah. say if she's behaving in a way that's not what you want and you use that marker, that yeah. you're going to reinforce that behavior, uh -huh. right? So what I would do is I would use her name the mm -hmm. second she looks at me, I'm going to mark with a yes, I terminate the behavior and I run the other way. Um, that's going to be lend itself a little bit better um, than a duration marker. Okay. Um, so try that and uh, let us know if, if you're still having troubles with it, then um, let us know for sure. Yeah, it sounds like that's the missing piece of the puzzle is because it, I'll either stay still or I'll start to approach her. The running away, I think, is really going to she won't like that she'll come and, and you or if you need to run and hide right mm -hmm. um but if you play name game and mark and move on leash um for say three or four minutes five minutes before you let her off leash okay i would just about bet that that the first time she goes to grab something else and you do the exact same sequence mm -hmm. um it'll kind of change how she feels uh you know the kind of the story goes okay Awesome. Try it and let us know. Okay, thanks so much. Can I chime in as someone else who deals with it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> when I take her out on the trails and I, if she starts to try doing the keep away, instead of me trying to track her down or get it or whatever, I'll just walk the opposite direction like I'm leaving. So she's like, oh, I got to go with you. And she drops it instantly and comes. Would that be similar to, I know I'm not marking and moving, but I don't hide quite. I just turn around and I'm like, I'm not engaging in the keep away. You want to run away from me? I'm just going to walk away. So yeah, kind of for like, sure. Kind of for like sure. And they bite you and you just are like, okay, playtime's done. Yeah, one thing you could do because she did make a big decision there. She, she made the decision to leave that item and catch up with you. I might mark her when she's real close to me yeah, and I'll here her in that really close. nice reward zone. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you're doing great. There's you some betcha. Good questions coming up here about better going smooth. All right. Um, Heather and Derek have two questions that aren't related to each other. So I'll start with the first one. How do we differentiate go sniff with better go? We started waiting for eye contact before Q and go sniff. However, sometimes he needs to use the bathroom. So is, is it appropriate for him to ask before needing to do that as well? Okay. So go sniff. Um, better go in a nutshell. Oh, uh, sorry, um, Heather, let me just clarify um, the question. Uh, so we are in a gated townhouse complex. So when we go out in the, at any time to like kind of go for the washroom, uh, in the past, we've just walked him out and walked him to whatever grass or gravel or wherever we are, we have a back alley and we also have an area with grass. So we've just done different things and I've always just said better go now or better go. And what I have noticed because of the, with the go sniff and really working on that and him kind of asking permission and the one, two, three, go say hi. I realize that there's times when we're out and then I'm waiting for him or making him sit before he's and then eye contact before I release him and then but sometimes in the morning I'm like okay well how do I differentiate to make sure that he can he doesn't have to ask permission to do the better go and so I just need some clarification on that so it, it sounds like you're setting it up really nicely um, and if he's really clear that when you say better go it is for him to toilet in a nice quick fashion, I don't think um, you'll have troubles, right? So if you are in a hurry in the morning, so if I get the last part of the question right, so you wanna make sure that if you're in a hurry, um, that he doesn't need to ask to go to the bathroom. Is that the question, kind of the end of it? Uh, exactly, and he does okay. pull a little bit <laughs> to okay. get out, so. 
so it's part of the trying to make sure the pulling isn't happening either. Yeah. So the more you set up the sequence of him not pulling before he gets to toilet is going to help, which you're doing right now. Um, but I wouldn't be worried that um, he's always needed to ask for permission because what the end goal is, is when you say better go, even if he doesn't have to completely drain his bladder, that he's still trying, right? And so keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, what I would do is practice and everybody on, on the call should practice a bit. Typically what happens when we set our dog up to, to better go is we will cross a threshold in textures, sometimes and typically. So say if I'm on a street and I want to toilet my dog on the grass, that texture change between pavement and grass is a visual cue. And so what happens is when you start to just do a let's go across that same transition, that same texture change, a lot of times you will see the dog's head dump down onto the ground at that second and so work with him going from when he expects you to tell him to better go work on better or let's go going from gravel to grass or from pavement to gravel and so he doesn't start to think that the contextual cue the visual cue of that transition is part of the whole better go sequence does that make sense uh yeah for sure i think that overall the better go is pretty good it's just um uh yeah I, and he, I don't know if he's got the visual cue because we've used a lot of different surfaces around our place uh so it's usually just the line right it's usually okay. like oh I, okay I the it. line of between grass it's not usually um the gravels the texture it's like that transition between one surface to the other I find is always tricky for the dogs okay. um and then with the go sniff, um, as long as you're reinforcing him peeing with the go sniff, the peeing will come quicker. If you're letting him sniff around to find the spot and then being on your way quickly after he pees, you will get more sniffing and a longer distance between when you ask him to go and when he pees because he's starting to understand if I don't sniff enough, I don't get it. But what we want him to understand is as soon as you pee nice and quickly, then you get the reward. Is that kind of what you're doing? Uh, so with the better go, we haven't, no, no, this, sorry, with the go sniff part, this has just been, we weren't, we didn't know about that a lot earlier on. So this is pretty new with the go sniff with us, uh, just through yeah. these, these big classes we've been doing. So what I've been doing is having him sit, having him make eye contact, um, and then cueing him to go sniff and letting him have some time to sniff around before we then continue on our way or let's go. Um, and, but I haven't, we haven't ever done a go sniff after be, better go as a reward for doing it right away. So, so that's he, what you're going to change. Okay. Yeah. okay so the go sniff is the reward for peeing quickly. And then you will get a really, it, it'll become more and more quick where he's like, oh, if I pee really quick, then I get to sniff. A lot of times what we do is they noodle around, they sniff, 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 and then we're running behind and they pee and away we go. So you're taking the sniff as, you know, him rewarding himself to go sniff is like, that was perfect. I'm rewarding you having a nice quick pee. Okay, that's great, thank you. Awesome, great question. Okay, and then part two of the question was, do you ever do a review or crash course for the older dogs on prepping for the public access test? Oh, we've been talking about this. Um, so I talked to uh, my Calgary group. We just had a class right before this. Um, and so what my hope is, uh, is to get with um, uh, Margaret, Jackie and I, and to come up with um, a bit of a, a pre-assessment you know, sheet so that you guys who have older dogs who are kind of waiting um, to come into advanced training that we can have give you guys a sheet you can look through it um, we might be able to do you know if we get doing some age specific uh, type classes or check-ins it'll be so that we can go through a list and you guys can kind of see what what we're where we're at so it's something we should have done a long time ago um, but I think we're 
we're in the right time where we can start to make some of this, these big hopes and dreams happen. So. All right. No last goal. Sorry, did you want to jump in, Heather? I saw you come off mute. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you. Laura's 22 months, almost 22 and a half months. And Jackie, I think you shared this really cool uh, document with the, the public access assessment, the types of things they're looking at. Uh, somebody shared some. I think I asked for it to be shared, but I don't think it was me. I think was, somebody did, though. Yeah. Yeah, it was shared, and it was. It's it's pretty cool. It's this this document, um, and so I've just been going through it and talking to Dana a lot and asking lots of questions during Tuesdays, like what are the things should we be working on, and um, what are what are the things that kind of is successful versus not successful. So we've been doing a lot of. Um, duration sits, duration stands, duration downs right now, and and distraction during it, and touching, and walking over, and getting other people to walk up to him. Um, and of course, we've been doing some of this all along, but not concerted effort. So um, I just would love to have that checklist now that he's older to make sure that we've spent some really focused time on the different things to set him up for the best success that we can. Awesome. All right. Uh, Nola says, is it okay to just avoid go sniff altogether? Even if I have asked Blaze for a better go now and he has given me several dribbles, as soon as I tell him go sniff, he will immediately be getting ready to mark. So I pull away and tell him not there. I feel he isn't learning anything with go sniff. I mean, if, if he will not put his nose down even for a half a second before he pees, then yeah, you could eliminate the go sniff, but chances are he's still sniffing. And so I would rather keep it in the equation and use it at the right end of the equation. Um, you're going to be really thoughtful about uh, the locations that he pees and so that there's nothing upright. So not close to any trees, buildings, anything upright where he wants to mark. Um, but Jackie, I'll let you kind of get into more of that if you want to, but as long as there's absolutely no sniffing before the pee, then you, if you want, can eliminate the sniffing after the pee. If there's any sniffing before the pee, you cannot really um, build a behavior stronger um, and have a quicker pee if um, you're not rewarding him after. Does that make sense? Can I talk to you for a sec? Yeah, you bet. You should have been listening to me. So when... Oh, are you guys talking to us, uh, Monette and Rob? Oh, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I didn't know my was unmuted. <laughs> no, that was just really interesting content. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you anything bad. Okay. You guys are cute. That was cute. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Heather, I think that's it for questions. And we are at 729. So we are just in time for our 730 wrap up here, 830 wrap up there. And uh, yeah, thank you guys all so much. Thanks, guys. Chat soon. Yeah. Bye, all. Bye now. <laughs>